In discussing Tantra, uh, previously I did a video on Mantra Meditation, where you repeat something over and over and over again, you know, preferably for an hour or so, if not longer. Sometimes I go for four hours. Um, and unlike some views of Mantra Meditation, I tend to subscribe to the view that belief is irrelevant. Um, belief in the actual efficacy of chanting mantras. In other words, efficacy in terms of altering the outside world, i.e., you don't chant mantras to help you win the lottery. You don't chant mantras to uh, improve the weather. You don't chant mantras to get a god's attention. You don't chant mantras for any of that stuff. Um, I know that me saying you don't chant mantras doesn't mean that a lot of people don't do it for exactly that reason. Um, in fact, I would probably guess that the overwhelming majority of people who chant mantras believe that in some way it changes the phenomenal universe. The act of chanting. It's, you know, when you see these things like Buddhist prayer wheels where you just walk along a whole bunch of them and uh, you just um, twirl them, and just the, f the act of the, these prayer wheels twir twirling with nobody watching them is supposed to have some effect on the phenomenal universe. Um, I don't subscribe to that at all. <laughs> um, I just sort of say that if you actually do engage in mantra meditation, even science says something happens. <laughs> uh, it, it affects your central nervous system in a measurable way. It affects your heart rate, it affects your blood pressure, it affects your brain activity. And hard science, as I like to call it, uh, agrees. <laughs> So what I'm approaching Tantra from is the position that, in my opinion, Tantra is the deliberate manipulation of experience in the hopes or with the intention of, um, I guess you would call it self-improvement. <laughs> um, you want to engage in certain types of experiences that will affect you in a positive way. Um, and your experiences, as I say, are as real as anything gets. That's karma. I know I exist. I know I have experiences. Um, <clears throat> now, that's mantra meditation. There's other things that go along with this. Um, mantra, yantra, incense, flowers, and Murti. <laughs> this actually is not Indian at all. Uh, it's a little statuette I picked up as just a keepsake, and it was just sold as a keepsake in Burma in, I believe, 2009. Can't remember, though. Um, and a murti is a little image of a god that you do puja to or that you do some sort of little act of worship to. Um, idol worship, I suppose, if you want to get you know slightly pejorative about it. Um, I tend to approach these sorts of things. Again, this goes for incense, music, mantra, um, any kind of little outward physical act. I don't believe these things do anything in and of themselves. <laughs> in and of themselves. I don't think that it makes any difference whatsoever if I blindly bow down to this thing. <laughs> um, but, like the Buddha, I believe this is what the Buddha would have thought or explained, it's not so much that I don't believe in the gods or that I don't want to um, expect anything from them, but the gods, even if they do exist, are irrelevant to this. None of what in my opinion, Tantra is trying to do is um, in any way uh, a means of trying to sort of stack the deck in life in your own favor. You're simply trying to influence your experiences and your inner life. Um, if you have nothing but good experiences in life, we all know what happens. If you have nothing but bad experiences in life, we know what happens. So, 
Tantra as a means to control one's own experiences, as it were, from the driver's seat. So, if you stare into a yantra, which is a, um, a geometric design, I'll leave a link below, uh, and you chant mantras with music on and playing, or sorry, burning incense and this kind of thing, um, I don't believe that that's going to actually have any effect on the outside world, but it might have an effect on this. When a sort of skeptic studies these sorts of things, or as I say, a sort of skeptic, a particular species of skeptic, what they're trying to look for is, or what they're looking for in, in terms of um, attacking this kind of thing, or critiquing it, critiquing any kind of ritual, is they're trying to sort of get you to say that you expect some actual effect out of this, and then, you know, the Western bias, i.e. verifiability, kicks in, and you sort of say, well, what you're doing isn't doing anything that I, as an outsider, can see. That's my problem with the Western scientific method. Independent verification is impossible with the experiential. Only I can experience my experiences. I cannot uh, convince anyone else or no one else can verify whether or not I had an experience. Western science, therefore, says that's irrelevant. Even the Buddha, in a certain way, went along with this. People would ask him about the gods or whatever, and his response would usually be... In other words, I'm not getting into that. <laughs> um, so, you gaze at your little, I think this is a bodhisattva, don't know if it is though. You gaze at that, you chant mantras, your mind relaxes, you get into a nice place in your mind, you do that enough over the course of your life and you might actually improve your mental health or your physical health or you might improve um, your general state of well, sense of well-being, that kind of thing. Um, you might be able to say that okay it's all in your head but that's the point. <laughs> you know when you have, when you have a sort of uh, benefit that's all in your head, it's still a benefit. <laughs> the fact that it's not independently verifiable is irrelevant at this stage, at this level. Only you know whether or not it's effective. And it's all very well for somebody to ridicule you. Let's say that, you know, for whatever reason, I was to go outside into a public place, put this down on the pavement, uh, get down on my knees and start praying to it. Okay. I think a few of the passers-by might have something to sort of say about that. Probably a few people would be in, uh, impressed. Wow, this guy really believes all this. Other people might go, oh my God, <laughs> what, what a lunatic. Why is he doing that? Um, their opinions, if you ask me, at this level are irrelevant. Even if I'm in a public park and I'm doing this in public and I'm bowing down my little friend here, nobody knows what effect this is, happen this is having except me. Western science is useless when it comes to the experiential, simply because Western science relies on verifiability. Experience is not verifiable. I know I'm belaboring this point, but it's so important to bear this in mind. If I chant mantras, if I smell incense, if I gaze at yantras, if I do even a little puja or anything like this, I agree. It's no different from any other physical activity. But if it is different to me, then it will have an effect. <clears throat> the problem is, of course, this unverifiability works both ways. I might sort of have some profound experience in my meditations or in my um, mantra chanting or something like this, and I go, oh my god, i got to talk to somebody about this. That's a huge mistake. <laughs> Although I suppose you could talk to somebody who's sympathetic or who's into it, who's, who's able to sort of, in a way, speak in the same code as you're speaking in. But it's a bad idea to sort of say, I found the 
solution to my problems and it might work for somebody else or whatever. No, no, no. You've got to remember this is the experiential, this is the inner workings of your own experiences. This is you in the driver's seat or at least in the viewer's seat of the Cartesian theater. Um, this is the ultimate you in there. This isn't. Uh, <laughs> this is. This is again at the level of experience. You can't explain to somebody else the experience that you've had, and in, in a certain way, attempts to do so only cheapen the end result. If you ask me, by the same token, nobody else can criticize you for doing what you're doing because they don't know the effect that it's having on your experiences. Um, Seen in this light, I think, Tantra makes a great deal more sense, and these weird diagrams and bizarre esoteric theories start to make a little bit more sense. Or at least you find out how little sense you've been attempting to make of these things by simply writing them off. Um, again, I put that down, I think, to the scientific bias, uh, as well as the um, traditional bias that the skeptical West has had against anything that looks like mysticism. Um, as I say, I'm as guilty of this as anybody else. I don't do any of the things that I explained. I don't meditate to incense, I don't chant mantras, I don't gaze at yantras or anything like that. The only thing I do do is I, um, I meditate and I guess I repeat mantras or whatever repetitions I do inside of my own head, maybe with music. I'm under no illusions that I'm going to summon any gods or anything like that. <laughs> no, I never believed that in the first place. But Tantra will help you manipulate your experiences. It will help you control your experiences rather than being on the receiving end of them. Rather than simply being sort of a passive, as it were, subject um, actually passive object of your experiences, you become the subject as opposed to the experience. It's not information or whatever is stimuli coming in at you. It's turning it around so that the experience is at least manipulatable from the inside. A um, little bit like psychotherapy, I suppose. Um, but a little bit more profound than that because um, Tantra also deals with the physical. All I'm dealing with right now is the experiential, uh, the experiential of the psychological and the emotional, by the way. The experiential of the physical is absolutely fantastically interesting, if you ask me. That's going to be a next video.